Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. My guest is European Commissioner and Vice President Margaritis Schinas. He's one of the Commission's eight Vice Presidents and his wide-ranging portfolio ranges from migration and asylum to security issues, education, and what the EU calls promoting the European way of life. Margaritis Schinas comes from Greece and he's been involved with the European institutions since the early 1990s. He's a true veteran of the Brussels political scene. Uh, I can take the veteran as a compliment. Yes, it's not, it's not about age or anything like that. Uh, so thank you so much for being my guest, Vice President. Um, you've just been tweeting about new initiatives to strengthen integrated border management and expedite returns. So let's talk about this whole asylum issue first and what is uh, integrated border management? Well, we're trying to build uh, holistic, cohesive migration and asylum policy for the European Union. This is something that we desperately need. It's one of the historic failures of the EU uh, not being able to produce such a system. It has obliged us uh, most of the time to work as uh, firefighters uh, running from one crisis to the other. Now the time has come to to produce this big agreement on the basis of a set of proposals that's on the table since September 2020. So how is this going to look like? I mean, this is something that uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an analogy that I have used many times in the past. I'm sure you have heard it. Uh, we're building a house with uh, three floors, a three story building. The first is relations with origin, countries of origin and transit. We'll never be able to manage internally unless we manage externally. The second one uh, relates to your question. The second floor is border management. That means a more collective system for, for protecting our external border and uniform border procedures for all member states. And the third floor is the solidarity floor, a burden sharing arrangement so that all 27 member states share and, and that third it's floor is really where things are not good because we have this letter from uh, a few days ago, six European countries co-signed a statement saying that asylum seekers are not uh, making their applications in the country where they arrive as they should be. Uh, so th it seems that European countries are kind of blaming each other still rather than building this solidarity on the third floor, right? If you ask me what the problem is, the real problem is that member states thinks at, at, at the present stage, member states want to take the lift and go straight to the floor that interests them. Mm -hmm. So solidarity givers uh, mainly want to stay on the first and the second floor and, and solidarity takers they believe that we can have the third floor without the other two. Mm -hmm. I have made it absolutely clear erga omnes, urbi et orbi, that this house would have to be constructed at the same time, mm. with all three floors equally resilient, and there will be no house uh, which would be half built. I, I'm really flogging this floor analogy, but the, the first floor, the border, uh, working with third countries. That's the second. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> D does the second floor, does that mean uh, punitive measures against third countries that refuse to comply uh, in cooperating with, uh, that refuse to cooperate, I should say, with the EU? No, I think when we're talking uh, about our relationship with countries of origin and transit, we need to do two things. Uh, basically, and most of it is, is happening, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we need to build partnerships, win-win partnerships. We have to help them mm -hmm. uh, create the conditions to make better lives for their people so that they can stay there instead of put their, hands in, uh, the, their lives in the hands of the smugglers. That's one thing. And this is not only linked to money and investment. This can also be uh, Erasmus scholarships. It could be visas. It could be trade preferences. So we need to mobilize everything we have yeah. and make this a win-win partnership. And, and just very quickly, to, to I know you're moving on to other things, uh, not security, but given we have this template now of the UK-France migration deal with this detention center that could be set up in France, is that something that European Union should look at as well with third countries as kind of externalizing security in that way, or is 
that the wrong way to go? Yes, this is the wrong way to go. This is not compatible with the European way of life. In the past, uh, uh, there were attempts to uh, exploit these extraterritoriality options. Mm. They all failed. Mm. And if you ask me, Europe cannot and should not subcontract our obligations in producing a holistic migration policy. We have to do it ourselves, but we have to do it the proper way. One of your uh, portfolios, as I mentioned in the introduction, is uh, promoting the European way of life, which I suspect most people in Europe wouldn't really know instinctively what that means. Uh, but it has been said that with this cost of living crisis in Europe, wages falling in real terms because of inflation, that uh, this idea is perhaps more hollow now, uh, given uh, the reality of what life is actually like for many Europeans today. Let me first give you a definition of the European way of life. It's, we are a union of democracies, minorities are protected, the role of women is safeguarded in the family, in society, in the workplace, we are the world champions of human rights, we have universal and free education and health systems, we take care of our elderly and we do not have a death penalty. That's the European way of life. Piece of that, uh, pieces of all that you can find elsewhere, all of this together yeah. you will find it in Europe. Now, clearly the external pressure on our way of life, first the pandemic, now the war, all sorts of um, instrumentalization, or weaponization of energy, migration against us. This is something that uh, raises issues of sustainability, of, of, of how this model can be sustained over time. Uh, my uh, reply is pretty obvious, it can. And I think that each time that we suffer from this external pressure, that also galvanizes our unity and our willingness to move together. D does promoting Europe's view of itself as a human rights haven, in a sense, uh, does that mean speaking up on human rights issues outside Europe? Because, of course, your critics said that you didn't do that enough when it came to contacts with the Gulf states and their human rights <laughs> record. I think defending our way of life, our model of democracy, is something that is happening in a way, uh, in any case. We, we don't need to have to be very active promoters. You see it, you saw it in Maidan, you're seeing it in, in Georgia, you saw it in the Arab Spring. People want to live the European way of life, they want to live in democracy and freedom. Now, of course we have an obligation, of course we have an obligation to, to defend and project what makes us uh, uh, relevant uh, to all parts of the world. But there is a difference. There is no way that we can impose this to others. No, but you could perhaps have been more robust in highlighting some of the uh, problems in the human rights records of the Gulf states. At least that's what people have, have been saying in the last few months. No, I think uh, when it comes to the, to the Gulf states, we have uh, uh, Josep Borrell, the high representative, has uh, uh, proposed and we adopted a comprehensive new strategy for Gulf, for, for, for the Gulf states that clearly identifies our strategic uh, involvement uh, with this uh, region in terms of energy provision, in terms of security, in terms of people to people. But clearly, this does not lead to the, how should I call this, the u automatic Europeanization of, of the region. This would take time. Um, I, th there are signs uh, of uh, positive movement in certain uh, countries, but clearly nobody in this building at least is under the illusion that this uh, region will be Europeanized because of our strategy. So promoting the European way of life Part of that obviously means that political elites have to be seen to be accountable. So I have a question for you in relation to the Qatar Gate scandal. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, or there was initially, about this high authority for transparency, which could have improved the image of the European Parliament in the first instance. Uh, why do you think it's been taking such a long time to actually 
move forward with this, uh, this, this authority? First, let me uh, reiterate uh, the President's uh, commitment uh, for the Commission to present this proposal for an external uh, body on ethics that would be of interinstitutional uh, uh, application. I think this is long overdue. Um, the, the reason for not having it, uh, I would say, is uh, because the European Parliament, as all elected parliaments, are uh, uh, very... Um, um, logically, I would say, or in a way that's easy to comprehend, uh, that they th uh, think that their autonomy is linked to the fact that they're directly elected. So this democratic legitimacy that comes from the voters requires specific arrangements. But in the meantime, yeah. we found out that uh, the problems uh, uh, of corruption are deep-rooted, are horizontal, so th this approach is, is more necessary uh, than ever. Uh, can you tell us anything about what the composition of this authority could be? Because obviously if it has a lot of um, inside people, then it's not going to be seen as, as particularly credible. So w what, what do you think is going to actually be the composition of uh, this, this authority as, as it's been outlined by the Commission President here? Yes, uh, this actually uh, is not under my responsibility. This right. comes under the responsibility of my colleague, Vice President Jourova, who is responsible for values uh, and transparency. And I would not like to prejudge sure. the specifics of the proposal, but I agree with you. I think that such a body uh, uh, to be able to offer external neutral advice at an institutional level would require a certain uh, degree of autonomy and, and external thinking, if you like. OK, I think we've run out of time, but thank you so much for this uh, wide-ranging discussion, Vice President Schienas, and that's all we have time for for this part of the programme, but I'll be back in a few minutes for part two of Talking Europe with my panel of MEPs, so do join me in a few minutes. Thanks for watching.